Okay? And he stands up on national television, takes full responsibility, and has two quotes, I think, of significance that you need to know. The first thing he said of significance in my mind is he said, quote, I am the responsible officer of the government. He says, quote, I am the responsible officer of the government. So, Rachel, what's he saying when he tells the American people, I am the responsible officer of the government? He's the head, he's the in charge. Right. It's like Harry Truman's comment wasn't, I'm, I'm the responsible officer of the government. He said, the buck stops here. And that's basically what Kennedy's saying here, is I'm the responsible officer of the government. It is my responsibility, no one else's, that this invasion went south. The second quote I think is the best one. It deals with everything in life. Life, sports, everything in the world. And he said, quote, Victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. Victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. Is that, I'm just going to make a, a, a sports analogy. Of this. Okay. Andy, you guys went down, played your playoff game. Okay, lost. And how does that relate to this quote? Victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. And then if we would have won, like, we would all be the same. Oh, yeah, we basically did Oh, you, well, not you so much, but I mean, everybody become, oh, go, Andy. I've been supporting the football team all year. Way to go, man. Geez, you'd had a hundred fathers. People said, oh, Andy, I'd like to be your father. Man, you're awesome. You are a winner. I want to be your father. Victory has a hundred fathers. Defeat is an orphan. Who comes up to you after you get beat? I mean, look at look at sports in general. Yeah, your mother might, because you're you're you're, you're not quite an orphan because your mother came up. But yeah, but you, but you get the point. So I don't care if it's the pro level, the collegiate level, or the high school level. If you are winning, if you are victorious, people are in the stands. If you are defeated, nobody comes. You're an and it's a great quote. Victory has a hundred fathers. Defeat is an orphan. That's what he said publicly. And he, it was his way of saying, I'll take responsibility, but I'll probably be all by myself here, right? <laughs> well, finally, eight months later, on December 29th, 1962, eight months later, on December 29th of 1962, the United States of America sent $62 million worth of supplies and goods to Cuba. On December 29, 1962, the United States sent $62 million worth of supplies and goods to the country of Cuba. $62 million worth of goods and supplies. Why'd they do that, Charles? Why did we and why did the United States send a country we can't stand $62 million worth of goods and supplies? That was in the Baltimore. That's what everybody usually says, and that's a good guess. No, we weren't going to apologize to communist Cuba. Yeah, yeah. No? What? No? What? That's right, for the surviving 1,179 exiles. Now, I think you have to give the president a lot of credit. What would most administrations have probably done? Just left them there. They're, they weren't our people anyway. You know, just hands off, rot, wash my hands. Kennedy gave $62 million worth of supplies and goods to Cuba in exchange for those 1,179 exiles. None died. They certainly probably had a miserable eight months in prison, but he brought them back to the United States and treated them fairly. I think you have to give him a lot of credit for that because not a lot of presidents would have done that. Okay? Now, that's, that had to be negotiated. This is a little bit of an ironic thing here. So somebody had to be the negotiator, didn't they, between Castro and Kennedy to decide how much money was going to be given and how to get these exiles back? Well, the guy that was the negotiator was an American lawyer by the name of James B. Donovan. James B. Donovan was this lawyer, political lawyer, who had negotiated between Castro and Kennedy the $62 million worth of goods and supplies for these people. Somebody had to negotiate. Ironically, James B. Donovan was also the guy that negotiated the release of Gary Powers, the man that was shot up, shot down over Russian airspace, for Rudolf Abel. Remember that trade? He was the one that negotiated that exchange also. So he was a political negotiator. He not only negotiated this Bay of Pigs exiles exchange for $62 million worth of supplies, 
He also was the guy that back earlier had negotiated the exchange of Gary Powers, the American pilot shot down over Russia, in exchange for the Russian pilot, Rudolf Abel. Now, the thing about the Bay of Pigs, when we sum it up, is his Ken, President Kennedy's first experience with foreign affairs was an absolute disaster. And people really began to question whether he was ready for this presidency with this youth and inexperience, because he did not have a good start. As we mentioned before, he will more than make up for it in the upcoming Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay? All right, that'll take us then to the Berlin Wall. Tell you a little bit about the Berlin Wall. You've all heard of that, haven't you? Now listen, before you understand anything about why we had a Cuban Missile Crisis, you have to understand the situation in Berlin. You've got to understand what's going on in the city of Berlin if you're going to understand why we had a Cuban Missile Crisis. Now let's just kind of back up, and I really don't want you to write anything down until I tell you. I just want you to listen, because we've got to set the stage. So let's move back to 1945, the end of World War II. 55 million people died in that conflict. That would be soldiers and civilians. And Europe just simply lay in ruins. I mean, it just looks terrible, okay? Well, do you remember when the Russian army was coming from the east, and the Allied army was coming from the west, and they met at the Elbe River near Berlin, and that's when they swept Germany clean, and the war in Europe basically ended. Well, the crown jewel, the thing that everybody wanted was Berlin. Russia believed they should have Berlin, because they lost over 200,000 soldiers taking Berlin for the Allies. And they wanted that. And it uh, didn't happen, in a way. The results of the agreement ending World War II stated this, okay? And I think we went through this, but I want to make sure you understand. So here's the country of Germany, okay? And here's the city of Berlin, okay? Now, when they made this agreement that ended World War II, they divided Germany in half. The eastern part of Germany would be communist under Russian control. The western part of Germany would be non-communist under the control of the Allies, France, the United States and Great Britain. Now, Britain, or excuse me, Berlin was the crown jewel everybody wanted. And so they decided to divide the city of Berlin in half. The western half of Berlin being non-communist and the eastern part of Berlin being communist. That becomes difficult because the city is 110 miles inside communist East Germany. But that was what was agreed to. And the United States and France and Great Britain and most countries in the Western Hemisphere are going to do whatever it takes to protect those people in West Berlin so they are not forced to become communist. Okay, that sets the stage a little bit on what I'm going to tell you. Now, don't write anything down here. There were two Soviet premiers that dealt with Berlin. Joseph Stalin was the first one. And Nikita Khrushchev is the second. That's who we're dealing with now. And both of them hate the fact that you have a non-communist entity in the middle of a communist country. Stalin viewed West Berlin as a thorn in the flesh of communism. Khrushchev viewed West Berlin as a malignant tumor in the flesh of communism. Both of them hated it. But Khrushchev was kind of an interesting guy. He was an aggravator, and whenever he wanted to aggravate the Western Hemisphere, the Allies, especially the United States, he would act like he was going to make a move on West Berlin, that he was going to hit Navy. And he kept going like this, and, and as many times as you do that, it makes people uncomfortable and you're ready to react to that because you're friends with her. Anytime he wanted to make the Western Hemisphere, and especially the United States, uncomfortable, he would act like he was going to take West Berlin, knowing that the United States would not stand for that. Now, this is a little bit off color, but this is what historians <coughs> say, so I'm going to tell you. Khrushchev once said that he was delighted to have control of East Berlin because it was like being able to squeeze the testicles of the West whenever I wanted to. What's he mean by that? I know it's a little off color, but what's he mean by that? He loved having East Berlin. He loved having East Berlin right next to West Berlin. Because any time that he wanted to aggravate 
the Western Hemisphere of the United States, he would make a move on West Berlin. He said, in his words, it was like being able to squeeze the testicles of the West whenever I felt like it. Seriously, that's the kind of guy he was. So if he wanted to tick off the United States or aggravate him, he would act like he was making a, a play on West Berlin. He was squeezing the testicles of the United States. Okay, now, when President Kennedy took office, he did not, for lack of a better term, want his testicles squeezed all the time. <laughs> and so he didn't want that aggravation. So as soon as he took office, he planned to meet with Khrushchev in Austria in July of 1960, or excuse me, June of 1961. In June of 61, Kennedy met Khrushchev in Austria because he did not want this aggravation every time Khrushchev felt like making the United States uncomfortable, he would make a play on West Berlin. Kennedy wanted to talk through this and say, listen, listen this is, we got to quit doing this. All this is going to do is lead to trouble and possibly a war. So those two guys get together in June of 1961. They're two days visiting. The entire topic is Berlin. And Khrushchev is just kind of elusive. And he's kind of a jerk. And he just doesn't give this young president much take, and they both leave this summit in Austria, and both countries go back and strengthen their military. Okay, it's just going to get more tense. The Cold War is going to get more tense, because Khrushchev doesn't have any interest in really appeasing at all this new young president. Okay, so they both just simply go back and increase their military strength. Now, if you were an East German, and you wanted to go somewhere where it was non-communist, where would you go? East You'd go to West, West Berlin. Berlin, right? And so people started making that move. Okay, people in East Berlin, well, people from East Germany were going to East Berlin and then making the move over to West Berlin so they could be non-communist. Well, it was estimated that in July of 1961, the number of East Germans that were infiltrating into West Berlin was about a thousand per day. About a thousand people from East Germany were going to East Berlin and going across into West Berlin. That was in July of 1961. By August of 1961, early August, that number raised from 1,000 a day to 2,500 a day of these East Germans who wanted to get away from communism that were moving into West Berlin. Well, why did this alarm East Germany? What type of people were these people that were fleeing? Well, don't think of anything like that. What type of people were they? What were they doing in East Berlin? What type of workers were they? Well, they were laborers. They were the labor force. So you're sitting there, if you're East Germany, watching at first a thousand a day, and then 2,500 a day coming into West Berlin, and you're losing all of your what? Labor force. So what did East Germany do? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. You're close. On August 13th of 1961, they stationed East German police around West Berlin and started putting up obstacles, preparing for what? The building of a wall. So did they? I mean, a wall just didn't appear. But as soon as they figured out we cannot lose any more of these laborers to the west. They started stationing East German police on the border of West Berlin and started putting up obstacles such as barbed wire, uh, uh, what we call schlag concrete, broken up concrete. Anything that would keep people from going into the city was put up along with those East German police officers guarding. Okay? Now these obstacles eventually became what? a big wall, which was 12 feet high and 97 
miles long. So here is the city, so to speak, of Berlin. Here's where they split the city in half, and the wall is 97 miles long. Does that seem odd to you, Weiss? Does it seem like a that would be a long length of a city, 97? Do you have this vision that this wall was put right here, right? So they couldn't go in, right? Actually, the wall was put... all the way around. That's why it was 97 miles long. Because it went all around the city. Basically saying no one goes into West Berlin from the east. Now some of the other class said, well what if somebody that was in West Berlin wanted to go over into East Berlin? Would they let them do that? Well sure they would. Because but they wouldn't let you back. It's kinda of like going out, you know, you leave for the dance, you don't get back in. You leave from West Berlin, you don't get back in. Yeah. Yeah. No, right. Now, listen to this. So, here's Naya. Naya and her three sisters and her two brothers and her mom and dad live in East Berlin. And during this easy infiltration, the parents weren't in any big hurry because, you know, they kind of didn't know what was going to happen. So, Naya, in this scenario, Naya's mother takes half the family and they're already in West Berlin. And the dad's going to come with the other half of the family when he, you know, maybe when he has a little time. Well, in the meantime, what do they do on August 13th? They all of a sudden put the police officers up there and say, no way. And now Naya's half of her family, her mom and dad are separated and her brothers and sisters live on two different sides and they are never going to get together unless Naya's family is willing to move back into East Berlin, which they're not going to want to do. They moved there for a reason. So this wall separates families. It's terrible. It separates families like you can't believe because it was done so quickly. Now, I would tell you that there were many people who successfully and unsuccessfully tried to escape communism into West Berlin. Some were successful, some were not. What did they do? What did those East German police do, Naya, if you tried to go west? Shot you. Didn't work. They shot you. That's what they did. If you were trying to climb the obstacles or layer the wall, they shot you. If you were digging tunnels underneath, which people did, and you were caught, they shot you. That's what they did. So this was a horrible situation, and it was not seen very positively by the Western Allies, was it? I mean, not at all. Now, that may bring your question of why did not the United States and President Kennedy intervene? Why didn't they get upset about this and intervene in this Berlin Wall? I'm going to give you three reasons why President Kennedy and the United States chose not to intervene when the Berlin Wall was established, allowing no one to go into West Berlin. Why would he allow that to happen, Aaron? Why would he not? I mean, he raised a fit you know, philosophically, but he never took any action officially. Why? There's three reasons why he didn't. Do you want to start a conflict? Okay, we're going to save that for last. Very good. Population? What was his big concern? What's the big concern of the Western Allies? That Khrushchev's going to do what? Take. He's going to take what? Well, so Kennedy's first reason he doesn't intervene is that if Khrushchev is building a wall around West Berlin to keep East Germans out, he's at least not trying to take West Berlin, right? Okay, so the first reason Kennedy doesn't intervene is he's thinking, well, I don't like it, but at least he's not trying to take West Berlin, because if he tries to take West Berlin, then we're going to have to take action, and that could lead us into a major conflict, which we'll talk about what Eric said. That's number one, okay? He thought to himself, well, at least he's not trying to take all of Berlin, okay? Now, that number two kind of ties in with number one. The tension between the Western Hemisphere and the Western Allies and Russia is based on what? Berlin. So if he's not trying to take West Berlin, then it's going to ease tensions between the Western Hemisphere and the Soviet Union. Okay? So it's kind of the same thing, but not exactly. The first one is he knows he's not trying to take West Berlin straight out. Second thing is he, because he's not trying to take West Berlin straight out, it's going to ease tensions between the West and the Soviet Union. 
And Aaron said the last one. His quote was, a wall is much better than a war. So the third reason why he didn't intervene is because he thought the wall was better than a war. Okay. Now, did he like it? Not at all. But he didn't feel like it was worth pursuing because it did accomplish the goal that West Berlin would stay non-communist. It did accomplish the goal that the Western Hemisphere would be less <coughs> tense with the Soviet Union. And he believed that putting up that wall wasn't great, but it was better than having a war. Okay? Now, in June of 1963, just prior to his assassination, Kennedy visited West Berlin, where he gave a very, very famous speech, which I will show you in a few minutes. And he was very well received by a large cheering crowd. Matter of fact, the people of Berlin still have memorials to President Kennedy there today. Okay? He was a great ally of West Berlin and non-communism. And he gave a very, very moving speech at the City Hall. Very emotional. And he had a lot of different quotes, and I'm going to show some of those quotes to you. But I want you to write down this quote, because I think this one is the most important one that he stated. And I want you to listen to it but as I say it and write it down. He said all kinds of things, and you're going to see it, and some really good things. But he said this. He said, freedom has many difficulties, and democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put up a wall to keep our people in to prevent them from leaving. Now, I'll, get you, I'll repeat it several times, but listen to what he said. Freedom has many difficulties, and democracy is not perfect, but we have never had to put up a wall to keep our people in, to prevent them from leaving us. In other words, the United States has never had to put up 